<clears throat> well, welcome everyone. This is a great pleasure to paint for you or with you if you're painting along. Um, I'm Julie Kapoor, as I've been introduced. Um, I am, I call myself a professional artist, not quite sure what that means, but uh, I'll run with it. And uh, I've been doing acrylic uh, landscape paintings for about 12 years. I was self-taught for about seven and then I met David Langevin, who you probably all know, and he kind of turned my art world upside down by teaching me technique that completely changed the way I was tackling my work and thinking about color and uh, even how I laid down paint, everything changed. Uh, uh, it's a little bit quiet, I'm getting comments. We're yes. Okay. Sorry, my husband's coming to help. Um, and I'll talk louder. So uh, yeah, so anyways, David also um, unofficially became a, a mentor for me. He, uh, he was very kind to support me throughout the years. And uh, is that better? Sweet, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and we launched Mastery. So I don't know if you've heard about Mastery. It's, I'm one of the founders. Um, it's an artist community that launched right here in Western Canada with David Langevin being our first mentor. And now we work with about 100 uh, master level artist mentors. And I'm a member getting mentored and I'm also now mentoring. So um, yeah, check that out. Uh, that's the only place that I teach is through Masterius. You can see it. Um, Oh, thanks, Anaisi. <laughs> How many of you are already Masters members? I would be curious. Say hello in the chat. I know a bunch of you are here too. Um, yeah, so today I am going to be tackling one of my well-known uh, stylized light in the darkness paintings. And um, uh, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the chat. I, I chose one that I've done a few times so that I can whip it off really quickly and answer your questions as we go. And um, this, so the way that I decided to do it is I, I have one that is almost done. Well, which you can see here, I guess I'll leave it there uh, on my other camera. Uh, and I'm gonna show you the finishing touches later, which is why I have it at about the 90, 95% finished point. And then the way that I start, should I just dive right in, Pamela? I'm totally taking over. Yeah, dive right in. Okay, here, awesome. here we go. <laughs> All right. So this looks kind of, well, it is pink. It might look a little bit odd on the uh, camera. It's, it's primary magenta, which is my favorite um, underpainting color. I do, I always do magenta first and I put it on in a glaze, which I'll show you how I do. And then I put my composition down in chalk. Uh, I first actually work um, with sketches. I have a sketchbook full of little thumbnail sketches. When I'm happy with something, then I'll put it down in chalk on my canvas. And, and then I can easily erase and, and adjust as I go. And then once I'm happy, I'll outline it in more uh, magenta by just pure undiluted magenta, whereas the wash is diluted with um, a gloss medium called GAC. And yeah, my technique is mainly um, using glazes and veils. Uh, to build vibrancy in the color and then I use it also to pair back the vibrancy and to uh, mute things down. I, my work starts really hyper. <laughs> uh, I paint in three layers and each layer kind of tones it down and brings it back to uh, something that's more balanced. So it starts pretty wild and messy. And then I finish with something that's quite uh, cleaned up. And um, I, I can show you, if you, you've probably seen my work, but um, when, it, when it's finished, like it really cleans up nicely. And uh, this is a piece that is finished. 
it looks a little bit washed out with uh, the light. My work is really vibrant, trying to get it to focus. And uh, anyway, so it starts off pretty messy and it cleans up with each layer. <clears throat> All right, and this is maybe, can you put it back to uh, my screen, Pamela? And this is uh, the, the magic sauce, GAC. Uh, 500 and 100. I do a 50-50 mix, which is how I build my glazes and veils. So it's a golden product. You can get that at Opus. Um, I mix it together into a squeeze bottle and I put a big puddle of it on my palette and I use it constantly. I don't think I ever put paint down without it being thinned out with GAC. Um, yeah, and then as I'm painting, I'll talk to you about, um, so my stuff is really flowy. I'm really uh, conscientious about guiding the eye through a painting. So um, I use different compositional tools like, um, you know, con different contrasts. So uh, the eye will go where there's areas of highest contrast, whether that's in value or in temperature um, or in, um, hard lines versus soft blended. So there's lots of different ways to kind of make the eye do what you want it to do. And so I love to guide the eye through. Um, if there's any questions, let me know. I'm just gonna check my notes. I wanna make sure that I don't forget anything. So this magenta wash, I'm just gonna share my screen. I want to show you one painting that is a good example of that magenta coming through. So from a distance, you can kind of see that there, there's a bit of a pink glow happening throughout. If I zoom in, we can get a better look. You can see how uh, it's like, I don't, I don't paint with the pink, I only use it underneath. So anything that you see that's kind of glowing, that would be uh, peeking through because I paint in really thin layers. And I never cover up entirely the previous layer. I always leave edges and hints of it showing. And that just creates a lot of depth and interest for the eye. And I find when I overwork, it becomes really flat and I can tell right away that I, I put too much paint down. Um, but yeah, it's fun, you can see it. I leave it as a bit of an outline. So I kind of do a lazy version of negative painting, <laughs> which I'll explain better in a minute. But anyway, so uh, that pink glow, I love. It really tones the work. It kind of sets the mood. Um, some people, prefer to use um, a more uh, muted tone, like maybe a quinacridone uh, nicolaus of gold, I know it's a very popular one. I like my pink. Anyway, so I'm going to get started. I'm going to share my palette like this. And then you can see what I'm up to there. And then I'm going to my other screen and so I'm just going to move my over there and then Pamela can kind of move back and forth between my two cameras. <clears throat> All right so here's my GAC. I just put a nice big puddle right in the middle there. Titanium. So I use fluid acrylics uh, I never use heavy body anymore. I started <clears throat> with heavy bodied and then I just found I, I was frustrated because I wanted to thin it more and more and more. And then I discovered, oh, there's fluids. <laughs> and uh, that's all I use now. Oh, and black. So yes, I use black. I love using black. It's my favorite color. I don't even know if it's a color, but I love it. Um, <clears throat> my other work, uh, I think my, my general palette colors were on the, uh, on the website where you register. And, uh, this painting I'm doing is going to be pared down. So, 
uh, it's going to be a lot of grayscale, which makes it a little bit easier for me to demonstrate the glazes and veils um, and paint quickly. So sorry, that was cad yellow medium is the first one there. And then this one is Darialide yellow, which I absolutely love. It's so warm and sunny. And then I've got my foam black. I love foam black because it's very transparent. So um, I found that with other blacks, I was really muddying up my colors very quickly and it was frustrating. But this one a little doesn't go a long way, so it doesn't make such a mess. I'm also going to use some gold. Where's my gold? So I've got iridescent gold deep and um, and the fine. A bit lighter. Where are you? This is the other one. And for fun, I'm going to do some green in the land. Um, I do mix green, but I also like to buy uh, colors that are already ready to go. Gold green, or green gold, sorry, is very translucent and it is so bright and sunny again. I just love it. But I'll also put some cerulean blue in the mix. Uh, and the glazes and stuff will be fun to play around with. Um, what else? I might need some dioxazine purple. So when I'm doing a more colorful piece, this is kind of my base for everything, for all of my neutrals. Um, I'll use dioxazine purple to tone things down. Um, we'll see if we use any of that in the land. And it's so dark and potent, so a little goes a long way. Let's see that. I'll move this back a bit. All right. All right. Um, all right. So to make a glaze, <clears throat> I always start with a big brush. Um, this is a two inch at least. One and a half, maybe actually. Anyways, it, it's uh, my bigger brush. And I'm going to put the paint on quite sloppy and fast. Uh, this is the fun color blocking uh, layer. It will look like a child painted it by the time I'm done the first layer. And then I know I'm right on the mark. <laughs> um, all right. And I usually start with my whites, lights, and brights because in this technique doing glazes um, you can lose your brights and whites and lights very quickly so I start with them make them bigger than I need and then uh, I start toning them back carefully so all right you can all right so a glaze is basically lots of GAC um, and paint so I'm doing and of course you can't see this is a this would be a veil so um, white and GAC. I'm going to put my white on uh, thin and then uh, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll show you as I go anyway so lots use lots of paint be generous um, don't worry about wasting it when I'm done I actually scoop it up and put it back into their little containers because I hate wasting paint but to be generous when you're building glazes and veils you need kind of a sloppy mess all right, <clears throat> we can switch to my other camera, Pamela. All right. Um, so I know that I've done this painting before. I'm going to want my lights around here. So I, I I um, draw the outline of everything and then I try to not cover it up. And this is the lazy man um, negative painting I was telling you about because I want to have a really clean look when I'm done. Uh, this is what I do to ensure I uh, keep it clean. I'm going to go into my golds. Um, if you see my palette, I'm just adding 
some of the lighter gold in with my um, my white veil here and I'll just continue long fluid strokes. Uh, so Julie, mm -hmm. is there, how would you describe the difference between a glaze and a veil? Um, a glaze is, is pure GAC and a color, a, a pigment. And then a veil would be, a pure veil would be GAC and white. And then you can tint the veil, which I do a lot of. So it'll be GAC, uh, white, and a color. But a glaze, the most vibrant um, um, tool, I guess, would be a glaze, which is GAC and just a straight pigment. And what it does is, um, I guess the sciencey explanation, it's like layers of stained glass is how we're creating this real vibrant uh, work. And maybe I'll just show you that. Um, I'll switch brushes here. So if you go back to my palette, Pamela, um, if I load my brush with the GAC and then uh, I'm I'm going to add a little bit of, we'll do Darialite yellow. And how much you add depends on how pigment heavy the paint is. Like bone black is really transparent, so you can use more, but doxazine purple is super potent, so you need to use very, very little to create a glaze. Um, so this would be glaze. There's no white in it. It looks uh, foggy because the GAC is white, but it dries clear. Anyway, so then if we go back to my canvas, then I can show you this magic of glazing. I'll just, all right. Hopefully you can see this well enough. So what it does is it puts the paint down really, really thin so that you can see the magenta coming through and it creates orange. Um, or it appears to be orange anyways. Now, when that dries, it dries like glass. And then when I go over it later with another color and let it dry, then I'm creating new colors, what appear to be new colors. But because the, um, the pigment is spread out, lots of light can get through and reflect back and show us that color really, really vibrantly. And that's how a glaze works. It spreads out the pigment um, and then you let it dry and do another layer which spreads out the next pigment from the first. And so, so much light can get through all of that and, um, and then it bounces back and we see very, very vibrant color. It's the most, um, the most uh, vibrant way that you can, that you can paint. Um, mixing colors on your palette can will always dull colors down. And the more you mix, the more dull it will, it will get. So sometimes using color straight from the jar is a good idea if you're looking for some real vibrancy or to put it down in uh, glazes or do both. So that is, and then a veil is you're adding white or a tint, tinted veil would be adding white. I want my moon. Just let me know if, uh, if my brush goes off screen. So this is a moon. Only 50% of people see moons in my crazy skies, um, which I thought was kind of cool. So I'm putting, putting more white lights and brights than I need. Again, I'm going to pair it back later. Um, but once I lose them, they're almost impossible to get back. So I'm going to be generous with them now. A little road happening here. And yeah, just thinking things through. I'm going to delve into some of my blacks now. I'll go back to my big brush, my one and a halfer. I get a bit messy, so I'm moving stuff out of my way. And are you working from a reference picture today? No, um, I rarely do. I um, All the stuff comes out of my head. 
sometimes if I'm, um, especially this really stylized, uh, the grayscale work is I'm not really thinking so much about what I'm painting. It's more about how I'm putting it down. Um, it's really lovely because I don't need to worry about getting things accurate. This is more about the contrast, the feeling, the flow. So it's a nice, it's more, more expressive, I guess. Um, my other work where I'm actually trying to make things look like, you know, a little bit, a little bit more accurate or um, less impressionistic. I, um, I will look at reference photos if I need to, like if there's a certain farm building that I, I want to capture well, then I might look at photos for reference. But otherwise I just, I find it much easier to compose things out of my head. Um, there's just a lot more freedom there. I used to paint from photos. That's how I started for sure. But I always found I was frustrated with the photos. Like I could never just use one. I would use three or four or five and take the lighting from one and the building from the other and the sky from the other and make my own composition anyways. Um, so it didn't take long before I just stopped looking at the, at the photos altogether. So as I'm, so oh. I, have, I have a small request here. Um, yes. Is it possible to pull your camera back a little bit so we can get a um, more of a view of the painting? Yeah, it's, uh, I can do a bit. Yeah, it'll just be a little bit of an angle if that's all right. What do you guys think? I can move, I can be a little better about moving the camera up and down as I'm working. Let's there. see. I'll do the, I'll work on the top a little bit. Is that all right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And did you add a blue to the bone black? No, I didn't add any blue yet. Um, this is just bone black, titanium white, and DAC. I've got a little fly joining me. Oh. Now there's an organic component. Um, so as I'm painting, I'm leaving the outline that I started with. I'm, I'm trying not to paint over it. I want to leave everything outlined. Um, so after this first layer, it's going to look a little bit like uh, a paint by number where each each spot kind of has its outline and I always keep a, a damp rag in case I go over that outline I can clean it up Another thing I'm doing is twisting the brush as I'm uh, putting paint down. Uh, and then you can get kind of funky shapes. You can get around the corners well. And as you can, as I go, hopefully you can see that the magenta is still coming through. So. By the time I'm done, there will be very little pure black. Um, the magenta is always visible. So then it really makes it um, more interesting and less flat. Oops. I'll dive into a little bit of color in the land so you can see that. <laughs> Um, so just for um, some clarity here, uh, there's a question in the chat about getting started. And with, with acrylics, um, instead of adding water, you're using the GAC 100 and GAC 500 at a 50-50 ratio, correct? Yes, that's right. 
And um, for your surface, did you prep it with any gesso before getting started? Um, I know I buy uh, the canvas ready to go. I think it comes with two coats of gesso, which is um, good enough for acrylic. I think with oil, you might need a third. I don't paint in oil though, so don't quote me. Um, yeah, I buy it ready to go. All right, wonderful. And for the folks all out there who want, who are wondering why an artist uh, puts gesso onto their canvas, it's usually to stop the, the pigment from absorbing in so that you actually save more paint and it doesn't soak right into the fabric. So when I put down my wash of magenta on my canvases, um, it's it's technically a glaze. So it'll be GAC plus um, my magenta, primary magenta paint. I mix it up and what I, the value I'm looking for is about a four. So if one is white and 10 is black, I want the value of the underpainting to be no darker than a four because every layer that you add usually adds value and unless you're doing into the lights and whites. And so painting can get really dark if you're using this technique uh, of painting in layers. So just uh, an FYI there. And how long would you estimate these thin these thin layers dry time? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, if I was painting a small painting for this demo, I might need my blow dryer handy to um, dry between layers, but pretty well it dries quick enough that by the time I'm ready to go back for my second layer, everything is dry. And I can do a painting like this in uh, two hours. So it, it dries pretty quick. Although I am in uh, Alberta, which is pretty dry too. So in BC, I hear it takes longer uh, to dry. So keep that in mind too. Keep a blow dryer around if you need. All right. Um, what brush are you using right now? Hmm. They're so dirty. Um, the, these ones are called Gold Sable, and I think Opus had something very similar on the website. Um, they're a flat, synthetic, long brish, bristled brush. Um, I like to go up to a two inch. This is, I think, one. Um, but they're all they're all basically flat. I find the edges it makes a nice clean edge, and I baby my brushes, um, clean them really well. And because I need that really clean edge, I have to take good care of my my brushes so that they don't go you know get all splayed, and then I lose my crisp edge. All right, so we go down into the land. Let's get some green gold in there. All right. So I'm going to start with the glaze. Maybe uh, you can switch back to my palette. I'm going to wipe this off, make a bit more room. And is that parchment paper underneath the paints or? This is gray palette paper. Yeah, so it's just the regular palette paper. Um, I tried using glass for a while and I hated it. So I went back to palette paper. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a glaze, the so straight GAC and the green gold. All right, and then if we go back to my painting, you can see how so the the yellow is dry now so I'm just gonna I'm gonna just put it over the whole thing 
and it just is so bright. And I can, I, I'm just gonna do the whole piece of land quick and easy. And then I'll show you how I clean that up. That won't take too long to dry. Adding a little bit of blue to that back. So this would be a blue-green glaze going down here. All right, we'll let that dry. The, um, <clears throat> I usually save my little horizon line for the end. I try to save the goodies, the fun part for the end. I try not to use a small brush until the end. It's just so tempting to get into the details, but resist if you can. <laughs> um, all right, so this is kind of the first layer is done. So you can see that it looks um, very loose and a little bit more like a paint by number. You can see all my outlines are still pretty well there. And with my next layers, I'm going to kind of pick and choose uh, to clean those up and cover some of them up and leave some showing. Just little decisions as I go. Okay. I'll do a little bit more work here and then we'll go back to the land. Uh, so Julie, mm -hmm. I um I posted the write up from Golden about GAC 100 and GAC 500 into the chat, um, and folks are kind of curious about the GAC 100 and GAC 500 50 50 mix that you're using. Mm -hmm. Now, do you ever like? I guess the GAC one five the GAC 500 is really fluid and it can often be used as an airbrush extender for quick drying, mm -hmm. easy spray, and isolation coats. Um, what when you're choosing these uh, two mediums, um, is there any specific reasons within your art practice why you've chosen these two mediums as your um, mix and your um, extender and everything? Are you able to elaborate? I, I can a little bit. Um, so the I used to use only the 500 um, and that was because that was what I learned from David Langevin, <clears throat> who was my first teacher. He has a, he went to great lengths to kind of learn how the old masters painted and then he teaches and shares that far and wide. And uh, he used a GAC 500, I think that was the, the, um, the one of choice. But what happened and what I experienced too was that the GAC 500 is, um milky and when you mix it with your paint it it makes it look lighter because it's milky but it dries clear so what happens is as it dries it darkens and that becomes quite frustrating as you're working um because acrylic already yes. does that and then <laughs> bless, bless you, you. <laughs> and then um, yeah, so it just becomes frustrating. So doing doing the 50-50 with 100, the 100 isn't, isn't as milky um, as the 500, and so the colors don't shift uh, so much. And, and that was, again, a David. Um, I, I was mentored by him at Masterius for about a year, um, and that was something that I found out at that point that he had kind of switched to, and so I switched to, and I, I much prefer it now. The color shift isn't such a big deal. Yeah, so I, there, there's not, a, it's more because that's what I was told to do. Um, but yeah, it, uh, if you want to learn about the GAX, go to uh, the Golden website, and they have lots of information there, and there's quite a few different um, there's 500 and 400 and 900 and they all do, they're all for a different purpose of which I can never remember. Thank you for that, Julie. No problem. That's the beauty of, I think of mentorship is that we don't have to discover these things the hard way. We can just learn from what other people have struggled through and save ourselves a lot of headache. 
So now I'm on the second layer and um, I'm not covering up the first layer entirely. I'm just thinking about uh, getting things a little bit more blended. And when you start, when you start your paintings, do you always sketch them out with paint? Yeah, I do. Um, I usually first sketch them out in my sketchbook. I'm a big believer in uh, planning things out and making mistakes on paper before I go to my canvas. I used to not um, sketch anything out. And then a friend of mine said, you know, you're going to save yourself a lot of trouble if you just plan it before you tackle that canvas. And sure enough, I, I started to sketch and save myself so much time. Um, and so, yeah, I really try to honor the composition. Once it's down and I've kind of put my outlines down in magenta, I don't change anything unless there's some big issue that pops up that I didn't notice. Um, I, I, yeah, so once once it's planned, once it's down, that's how I keep it. And that also just make, makes the painting a little bit more enjoyable because I don't need to be thinking about composition as far as layout goes anymore. Uh, I worked all that out, the decisions are made, and now I can just enjoy painting it. You can see that I'm leaving sections of that magenta, well, of, I should say of the first layer. So I'm gonna do that very intentionally. I want to leave big gaps and decide later how to pare that down. And do you have um, a regular amount of layers that you paint in the same area? or do you work yeah. more intuitively? Yeah, it's generally it's three layers, um, but I'm not, when I'm painting, I'm not really counting or, you know, uh, stopping after the first layer. I just kind of keep going. So it's definitely more intuitive. But when I started teaching, I realized I should probably know how many layers I'm doing. And then I realized, okay, it's about three, <laughs> about three each time. I find it really relaxing. I don't know. It looks like it feels good. Those yeah, <laughs> it does. It's um, a little bit cathartic. If anyone is in the Calgary area next weekend, we have a, a big event at Sea Space Creative Hub in Calgary um, with 10 of our master artists at Masterius who are kind of in Western Canada. So David Langevin will be there, Doug Swinton, Heather Pant, Cindy Ravel. There's about 10 of them. And it's going to be, I'll be there. Um, it's going to be super fun. It's kind of a gala-ish event. And you can meet the masters. We have their, uh, each one has a painting we're auctioning off for our charitable partner for the sparrows, it's called. And we're going to have painting battles and wine and cheese and, um, what else? Oh, panel discussions. We're going to tackle some uh, hot topics for artists. And then it's just like a mix and mingle. So you can meet the masters and uh, everyone is welcome. Okay, I'm going to go back to the land now. Uh, where will your event be happening again, Julie? I'll type it into the chat for everyone. Say that again, sorry? Where will your event be happening again? 
it's called C space. Um, I bet even Anne could type it in there. C space creative hub is in Calgary. So that's next week, Friday, October 7th. Um, and yeah, tickets are available. The art auction is actually already live online. And then we're going to close it that night. And uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's for our charitable partner. Um, I know David Langevin has asked to donate his entire painting uh, proceeds to the charity. So uh, yeah, uh, otherwise there's a portion of it going to the charity. It's going to be a hoot. Um, yeah, so fun. It's on the website under the events uh, at masters.com. A great way to connect and network. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the land. I'm sure you guys can see a little bit. Uh, go. <clears throat> Okay, let me think, I'm going to put down a glaze of dioxazine purple, so that's GAC, and just a touch, dioxazine purple is really strong, so just a tiny bit, and what I'll do is I'm going to lay down my shadows. So if the light is coming from behind the house, then there should be a shadow created here. Something like that. I might need more purple in there. Give it a little stronger. So Julie, say, say you're working on a canvas and you're using colors and all of a sudden you realize that you don't like the colors of a certain area and how it's turned out. Do mm -hmm. you redo it or how do you approach this situation? That's a great question. I usually adjust it with glazes and veils. Um, so I can, I can lighten and darken and, and shift the color by just doing, instead of repainting, this is the beauty of glazes and veils. Instead of repainting a section, you can just, if you want it to be brighter, you can just put a brighter glaze on it. If you wanna push it back, you would use a, a cool veil to push it back. Instead of having to repaint each kind of section in the right value, you can just shift the whole thing back forward, cooler, warmer, lighter, darker. Uh, it's much easier way to go. If I have, if I've overworked a section and it's become flat um, and I really, really want that depth back, then I will start over that, that area. I'll, I'll paint it white um, and then I'll do the magenta wash and I'll pretend like I haven't painted that part and start doing the glazes and veils again. So if I really uh, make a big mistake, I will do that. And that happens occasionally still. Sometimes when like, cause I do these little thumbnail sketches in my sketchbook, it doesn't always translate perfectly onto a large canvas. So um, yeah, it can become an issue. So thinking there's going to be some shadows. This will help, help make things pop. All right, so um, there's a there's a comment and a question here in the chat for you. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to read this out. So the sketch is done in advance, and are the color combinations also decided in advance so you know what is going where 
Do you decide the difference of values in advance? Mm -hmm. Great questions. How about I show you my sketchbook real quick? Um, Just grab it. <laughs> All right. This is what. Oh, here, I'll put it here. Down, 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 down. This is what my sketchbook looks like. Just little, you know, one inch, two inch thumbnails. Um, here I'd, I'm working out value grouping, so um, uh, value composition, I guess, and grouping the values together. And then I do work out the colors. Uh, sometimes I'll have uh, color swatches. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but there's little color bars beside the sketch. I'm trying to just, I can do a swatch of color to see them all together to see how they work. Uh, here I'm doing a cool versus a warm and then just the value. So yeah, I'm making lots of decisions in my book and playing around, taking notes. Um, yeah, so very handy. And then I, then it's always there, right? Then I can always go back and, oh, I worked with Charlie Easton and I took some notes. Oh, he said something important and um, yeah, lots of playing around. I paint maybe like one out of every 10 sketches. <laughs> but sometimes I'll go back and an old sketch all of a sudden is like amazing and I have to paint it, whereas I didn't see what was good about it before. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna put down some brighter, Spots where the sun is going to catch the land. So I'm going to do a, um, a yellow veil. So GAC, some white, and I'm going to do, hmm, I'm going to do dioxy or dairylite yellow. Sorry, I couldn't decide there. So this will be a yellow veil. And I'm gonna catch, this is gonna be where the sun catches the edge of the hill. Uh, just a little there. Maybe a bit here. So there's a question here in the chat about whether or not this process can be used with oils. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, I want everyone to know that there's a demo coming up with Diane Williams, where she uh, discusses um, a three layering system and she uses oils, something similar, mm -hmm. but slightly different. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and yes, it can. I don't paint in oils, but um, I, David Langevin paints, does his, does that sort of layering with glazes and veils in acrylic and in oil. I haven't tackled oil yet, but uh, yes, there is a way to do it with different products, of course. <clears throat> I'll let that dry and let me think here. I'll put in some of the, for the little house on the horizon. I'm just gonna do a black um, glaze. I still want the magenta to come through. And I wanna keep the edges because that's where the sun is gonna be catching the edge. We'll pull that out later. And I have a little window in the house that I want to glow yellow. So I'm going to leave that. Oh. 
All right, yeah, so really messy. We'll clean that up with time. Uh, so I have a question here about um, your pre-planning and coloring in your sketchbook. When you mm -hmm. do that, are you using pencil crayons or do you paint? Um, I'm using pencil crayons. Um, some, some artists I know do uh, watercolor, which I think is really lovely. Uh, I'd love to try sometime, but I just use pencil crayons. And of course, I don't have uh, necessarily the exact colors that match my palette, but for the most part, it, it does the job. When I do commissions, um, I plan it out in the sketchbook and then go back and forth with the client until the sketches are kind of in line with their vision for what they're looking for. So it's really nice to be able to just whip those off and, and uh, plan that together. So now you can see as I've, I've put down a green uh, glaze that the shadow still uh, is there. The light edge is pretty well there. Um, but I didn't have to paint each section differently. I'm just doing the glaze over top. So that, uh, yeah, again, creates a lot of depth, uh, not so flat anyways. And it's nice, has nice vibrant bits and then I'll pair that back. So satisfying to look at that. I don't know why. <laughs> and then I have a cooler. It's just green gold, cerulean blue, and gak. But because I put a shadow down there earlier, uh, it looks nice and muted and, and darker. Maybe I'll do that here too. I like having strong lines that flow. Uh, so I have a couple more questions. I'm loving the chat today. This is a really lively bunch. Oh, good. <laughs> Everyone. Um, do you use paints with different opacity? Is it even possible to purchase all colors with the same opacity? No, I don't think so. I wish. Um, I think on the on the um, paint itself, there's there's some um, number or letter that. Oh no, here it is. So on the back, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but there's this little chart, and the top one is transparent versus opaque, and then it has a little bar in the middle. So this one is closer to the transparent end, and then I can show you that. Dioxazine purple, where'd you go? Oh, and then this one doesn't have it. Well, that's helpful. Yeah, so no, <laughs> I don't think you can. You can try. Uh, usually when I'm trying a new color, I'll buy the very, very tiniest little um, bottle of it. So I'm not wasting too much money, but. I, I guess okay. folks could. Um paint with gouache if they wanted all the same opacity, although you would not be able to achieve what Julie's doing today. <laughs> <laughs> with gouache, yeah, I wonder. Yeah, with, with gouache. I've never tried it. Um, and then there's a, a question here um, about the magenta in the background, the pink in the background. What, what color is that that you started out with? The, the wash um, is primary magenta. Wow, it shows up so pink. Incredible. Yeah, yeah, it might be my, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty pink. Uh, a close one that is a little bit cooler is uh, quinacridone red. Very, very similar, just a touch cooler a little bit more neutral maybe. I like the 
strong pink. Okay, I'm going to go back up and clean this up a bit. When we get to about 15 minutes left, I'm going to switch over to the other painting that um, I showed you guys to do the finishing touches. That's one um, thing that always is hard to get to in a demo. This is finishing. Ah, the finishing work. All right. So I'll start with my and, and I'm, I'm moving down to smaller brushes with each layer as well. Start big and then move down. Um, I'm going to get into my and it's often I'm doing the same process with each layer, just uh, just less because I'm not covering up with each layer. Some gold in there. Um, if you so I mentioned I mentor at Mastrius. Uh, I think my group might be full, but there's a wait list that you can join if you want to work with me someday. I'd love to have you. I might open up another group. So join the wait list and then you'll get an email uh, when that happens. But in the meantime, I'm not sure when that will be. So if you're interested in mentorship, check out all the other mentors we have there. We have some of the best artists in the world. Um, I'm not a master, I'm a, I'm a um, professional artist, but we have about 100 masters that are just blow your mind. Um, amazing. And they're all lovely. I meet with them all and interview them and make sure that they're all kind and eager to give back and share. And we have a fantastic community going at Masterius. I'm a big, um, so I found my art journey, my, my experience was that the art industry was quite um, competitive. And as an introvert, that really kept me in my studio. And it's why it took me seven years to um, finally go to my first demo, which I'm embarrassed about now, but that was part of the problem. I was introverted and it all felt very competitive to me. I'd been to some art shows that kind of had a bad experience at with, and, and so it just caused me to kind of turtle as we call it. And, um, and so now that we're, I get to build this amazing community with, um, with our team, we're really, really conscientious about that. And we're putting an end to the competitive nature of our industry. We are all working together, chasing our goals while supporting each other and learning from the best of the best, which really saves a lot of time and headache trying to figure things out on your own. Been there, done that. Uh, so there is another question here with um, with teaching your style of painting. Are you ever afraid of coffee cats? <laughs> mm, very good question. I love you guys are great. This is a fantastic conversation. Um, you know what? I have been copied. Uh, I'm on Instagram. Yeah, please uh, connect with me there and I'll follow you back. Um, maybe send me a note or something. Oops, 
sorry, totally whacked the camera. Um, I have been copied by people on Instagram and it's funny because I think other countries must have other uh, copyright laws or no copyright laws because they'll they'll copy me and then tag me in their post uh, but not give me any credit for <laughs> anything. So yeah, it can be, at first it was really upsetting and then I realized, okay, uh, I couldn't really, um, I had a hard time getting past it. I found it to be, it actually hurt, hurt my feelings, I guess. And um, I didn't like the way I felt after and kind of dealing with those, those feelings. So I made a decision early on that uh, I wasn't going to freak out when people copied me. I would just give them feedback and let them know. And if they if they didn't kind of make an adjustment on their post or give me credit or, you know, uh, then I would just uh, block them or whatever. And um, Instagram used to be pretty good about, um, you can uh, report someone um, and they used to be pretty good about managing that. And I have found that not so much anymore. So teaching my style, what, I'm passionate about is helping artists find their style because I believe uh, very, very deeply that we're given this gift and that it's put in us very, very uniquely. And it is our um, pleasure and joy to let it come out and to nurture it. It's like, like nurturing a little animal you need to be patient and kind to yourself and honor how you even hold a paintbrush how you look at the world what inspires you about what you want to paint what motivates you to paint and why and just to enjoy that process of becoming um and yeah, and, and letting that style come out of you authentically. And that's that's in my mentorship group, what I'm part of the focus of what I'm teaching and mentoring around is helping artists to, to find their own style. So learning a technique is really important. And part of learning it is often copying the artist who's teaching it. And that's a great way to learn. Uh, then the job is to apply it to your own work and your own style. Um, when I learned glazes and veils, it took me about two years to really um, em embrace it and uh, make it part of the way I painted. And, um, and honestly, finding this style was hard. And a lot of you have heard this story before, if you've known me for more than five minutes, as I say, I was bashing my head against a wall for about two years, trying to paint like other artists whose work I loved. And I found it so discouraging because I, I just couldn't get there. And then one day I heard this little, you know, encouragement in my ear that, you know, maybe, maybe it's already in me and it just wants to come out and I need to let go a bit, trust the process, and embrace what comes out of me. And as soon as I did that, I, I, I and it was very physical, it was, a, it was very physical for me was, you know, my arm wanted to do these big sweeping movements. And so I found myself, you know, thinning my paint more and more and more and pulling it further and further. And sure enough, I got this really flowing style. And I just kept pursuing that and honoring that. Even though I didn't like it, to be honest, I didn't like it at first. Um, but I, I continued to honor it. And I'm so glad that I did. Um, because yeah, now, now, my work is very unique it's well known and I enjoy it like I find it very soothing to paint this way so my body obviously wanted it to come out this way and um yeah so that's 
that's what I, I want to teach about. And also because I'm a founder at Masterius, that's a bit of a um, mission, I guess, is to help artists. Because we're all learning from these masters, we have to be able to apply it to our own style because we don't need more Julie DeBoer's in the world. What we need is more of you. And, um, and it's so wonderful to find your style and let it sing. Uh, it's terrifying as well too. So I appreciate that artists are so brave. Uh, I can't say it enough. We put our hearts out there for the world to judge and judge they do. But what a joy it is to, to create and to pull stuff that's wonderfully authentic and unique out of ourselves. That's my little rant. <laughs> it's lovely, lovely to hear you talk, talk about your journey. Um, and uh, like your learning process and how you found your voice as a creative human. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a few comments, you know, people have been typing away as you've been been chatting and sharing. Um, uh, some things that are written are, yes, you can't try to be somebody else. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. and, and then there's um, a question, as you were learning and painting uh, with um, painting with the veils, um, Copying from your mentor, did you show or share your artwork? Um, I like, I'm still being mentored. So I'm working with Melissa Galazzi now. She's out of New York, I think. And um, I, yeah, like we'll, we encourage um, our members at Masterius to share what they're learning. So post it. Um, and so, yes, I do that too, but then we always give credit to our mentor, especially if we're copying from a reference photo or using their painting as inspiration. Um, we also do these painting challenges uh, at least once a month where one of our mentors will, you know, give us one of their paintings and a reference photo. And then our job uh, and what we, the way that we tackle that is to use it as inspiration, but then choose your own composition. You do it in your medium and try to do it with your voice, your style. And, and we still, you know, share that the mentor and we give credit where credit, credit is due. But yeah, I'm still learning. And I mean, we never stop learning, right? Um, this is, this is stuff that we'll always have to be thinking about as we go. Thank you. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, and then there's, I, I really like this comment in here. I'm going to read it out loud for any, everyone. Sam, Sam typed in, um, my mentor, Leah Dor Dorian, told me this, which has stuck with me. Anyone can copy your work, but they can't copy your experience and meaning. Mm. And then... And then Sam writes, I personally connect with an artwork based on the artist and their experience with the painting, not always the painting alone. Very yeah. interesting. Thanks for sharing, Sam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. And collectors collect the artists. Uh, there's, they're very interested about the artist and uh, and I think that's part of it, right? We've got we've got our own story that we're telling, our experience taints kind of everything that we do. It informs everything that we do, the way that we experience the world. And that's perfectly unique and what makes us all set apart and different. Okay. Um, and about layering. Um, so what, what layer do you think you're on currently second <laughs> or third and, and how do you know when to stop layering the different, uh, values, which eat with each swirl? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of stopping, uh, and looking at the whole, I often step back. I haven't done it yet, but, uh, it's really good and helpful to take a big few steps back, you know, a few meters. And then you can see kind of the whole 
the whole composition and see where there needs to be balance or where it's a little bit heavy on one side. So I'm doing it quite um, just intuitively currently, um, trying to think about not having it too stripy, trying to group the values a little bit more, which uh, creates a balance and is, is soothing. Um, patterns are good. Like if, if it was more stripy, it would be more energetic, I suppose. Uh, I'm looking for uh, soothing. I mean, it still is, uh, there's energy coming. And, and I'm, instead of covering up uh, the uh, pink outlines, this is the part where I'm kind of deciding where they're too strong. So I don't want anything big happening around the edge. Uh, so I'm gonna be doing a lot of blending and toning down and letting my contrast uh, tools I talked about earlier happen in the middle. And, and this would be one point of interest. This would be another point of interest and maybe a little bit up top. So as I pair away, I'm not covering it up completely. I'm just doing a veil over it. So you can still see the pink, but it's not drawing the eye so hard. I don't, I don't wanna pull the eye too close to the edge of the painting or it will go right off. Um, and onto someone else's painting. <laughs> um, but yeah, so just little decisions I'm making as I go. And I would say that there is like, this is still second layer. Now I'm getting into my third layer. And actually um, I could switch to that other canvas and, and clean it up. Is that all right if I do that guys? And then I can show you how I do the finishing touches for the last few minutes. Sure, yeah, let's, we're all curious. So there's a question here. Um, can you use water-soluble wax pastels instead of chalk? Um, if it's water-soluble, it should be fine. Uh, yeah, no oil pastel, but um, chalk pastel, I think is okay. I think it is. As long as it's water soluble. All right, so here's this painting. Um, <clears throat> it's at about the 95% mark. And I will, is it focusing okay? Yeah, let me know. And I'll just tidy this up. So I'm down to a half inch brush. Uh, I've got, it's a nice strong pink. It's a little bit too much. So I'm gonna put a, a veil of a similar color here. So that's a bit of white and yellow. Dirty it up with a bit of bone black. In it with some gack. Wipe it off my brush a bit so it's not too gunky. There. So it's a little more blended, a little more gentle. And your painting rack, is it made out of bike park parts? Say that again, sorry? Um, your rack, like um, that's holding your painting. Is it is it made out of bike parts? It this is actually um, Mastercraft. I got a Canadian Tire. So the 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 wall behind is these panel pieces, and they come with these great hooks. Here's here's a smaller um, one, and it just hooks into the panel, and then you can put your painting on it. And so the one here is 
um, just a thicker one that's under my painting I'm working on. And it has like a rubber coating so it doesn't slip when I'm painting, which is really nice. Mastercraft, I used to have, because I do really large paintings generally, um, I was I would have like three easels with, with holding one giant painting or three dif different ones that might be a triptych and I was tripping over everything and finally said I need to get these easels out of here they're slowing me down so my husband got these mastercraft it's for garages uh, you get a, a panel sort of in one box and we lined the whole the whole wall of my studio with it and it's so much better I love it I have lots of room now not tripping so much Hmm. Might want to, I'm going to perk this up. It's a little bit too orange for me here. I'll turn this up a bit. I want to add a bit of a pink. I'm going to put a little bit of magenta back in there. Glaze just a little bit. It feels a bit flat. So if I do, a, I don't know if you can see that, it just livened it right up. And I can, that's the beauty of the glaze, I can go right over the gray that's next to it. Um, and it just makes it a little bit more interesting. Very, very subtle shifts. It's to above the barn, that band of orange is reading really flat again. This is pulling really hard, so I'm going to push that back with um, some of the mucky gray. Because it's, oh, someone's at the door. Mm, I'm going to make that a little bit darker. There we go. Uh, let me just clean up the little, uh, I've got a little farm happening here. So I want to make it glow. Find a small brush. I'm going to make a, I'm going to use my CAD yellow medium and GAC, make a glaze. And then I'm Popping it in and around so that magenta outline now becomes more of a spot where the sun is catching the edge. And there's another little window in the little farmhouse.
you're hearing kitchen noises, my daughter's making lunch, it sounds like. Hopefully it's for me. I doubt it though. All right, so cleaning that up. Not covering up too much. I love the magenta coming through. And now I'm gonna just darken up that house a bit. Yeah, always putting gack in my paint. I just, I never put paint on to cover much. And Julie, do you have any recommendations for small brushes that maybe don't fray? Um, it, it sounds like someone's having troubles with frayed brushes. <laughs> yeah, I do like, so uh, the gold sable, there's other ones um, very much like it. Pretty much any decent quality brush. So you might have to spend a little bit more to get a good quality one. And then, um, and then baby them. So make sure that uh, after you wash them, um, I, I reform them. So I'm gonna um, pull out the water and, and clean up the edge and then lay it flat to dry so that when I use it the next time, it's in perfect shape and ready to go. So that might help. Thank you, that's some great advice. And have you ever tried a different base color other than magenta? Mm hmm I used to do cad orange. Um, it's another really lovely one. Again, I like the really potent ones. So if you're not as um, hyper as me, you might like, uh, yeah, Knapperdone Nicolazzo Gold uh, is really lovely. It's in the orange family. <clears throat> I've done yellow. That was not a good decision. Really hard to do a sky when you've got a yellow base. I've done blue. So if I'm, <clears throat> if I have, a, it, it sets the mood as well too. So um, I find because my work can be very, uh, like lots of stormy skies and stuff. I like having a bright underpainting so that it doesn't feel, the painting doesn't feel sad or, or heavy. It still has life and energy, like a good positive energy. Um, if I did maybe a blue on a storm scene, I bet it would feel very ominous. It could be really romantic maybe more so, uh, not that it would be negative necessarily. It's, and then when you put it down, make sure you get it into the, the tooth so that, sorry, that um, the little dimples in the canvas, make sure you get all the paint the, down in there. You don't want um, any of that white coming through. brighten up this road a little bit. So when I, as I'm painting, I, I have a big goopy pile and <clears throat> I, before I, here, I, I usually wipe it off on my uh, rag I have and then just work with what's left so that I'm not making a goopy mess. A little bit of punch there.
Now everything kind of looks like it's glowing in that low sun. So yummy. And you had mentioned that she saved leftover paint. Uh, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, so on my palette, you'll see I still have lots of puddles uh, of my paint. I've been painting for a long time. I actually mist it with water to keep it from, um, from the top drying. And then when I'm done, I just literally take my palette knife, scoop it up and put it back in the bottle. Um, you could call me cheap. <laughs> I hate wasting paint, but I like to have lots of it on my palette. I found if I'm being stingy with my paint, the, the painting process gets really frustrating because I'm never, it's like I'm painting um, on a diet or something. I, I just can't, um, I can't pull the, the brush as far as I'd like. I can't have fun with it. Now I'm just fooling around. It's just pulling too hard there. I think uh, <clears throat> next week we're doing live critiques. Uh, if you want to join us, um, it's an hour of live critiques and you can just watch and take notes and learn. Um, this was pulling a bit hard, so I'm just toning that down. And then this is too bright. Yeah, so guiding the eye, I've got my interest point here. Um, my intention is that the eye actually travels up the road. So I'm going to soften this and mute it. The eye generally goes from soft to hard edge, from muted to vibrant, from blended to, you know, hard edges. So that's how you can kind of make the eye go the direction that you want. Keep the good stuff in the middle, not, not right in the middle, but you know, and then make sure that the edges are not pulling too hard. Um, so I, I should give you a little bit of a time check here, Julie, uh, just because mm -hmm. we'll start heading out where um, it's 1233 now. All right. And um, you're, you're welcome to um, keep going a bit here. I know you would have a few I know there's people who would like to stay a bit longer but I just want to put that out there in case um uh folks are are um off to spend their time on other things this afternoon mm -hmm. or well, more I feel... I, everyone's logging in from other places <laughs> <laughs> yeah um I feel like I'm almost done this uh this piece there's not much more I'll pull it back a bit. Maybe what I'll do is I'll post it <clears throat> on my Instagram and then you can see a nice clear shot of it. Uh, and I'm at julie.deboard.art on Instagram. And here, maybe I'll join you back with my face. Um, and I'm same thing at, on Facebook, julie.deboard.art. Oh, my website is juliedeboerart.com. Um, masteries.com. Where else can we find each other? Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll finish this up and I'll post it. And I do demos um, live on Instagram too, uh, through masteries.official is the Instagram handle for masteries. And we do painting challenges and lots of cool stuff. So uh, follow that one too, and we can paint together again. But yeah, I think I'm pretty well done this one. So, Amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much. You have such a unique and playful style. It's been an absolute pleasure to watch you paint today. And everyone, thank you so much for being here and all your fantastic questions and keeping today's demo lively and interactive. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's been a lot of fun.
Yeah, thanks guys for coming. Uh, thanks for all the questions. And um, thanks, Pamela, for uh, inviting me. It's uh, lovely, a very, an honor to share what I'm up to. Uh, and you're welcome, guys. I see your comments. Uh, you're so, so welcome. I hope that uh, um, that you, I don't know, I hope there was something valuable you can take away. And uh, most of all, I'm excited to connect. So let's find each other and stay connected. Um, yeah, hopefully I can come back one day.